Um, so, uh, first and foremost, I, I so want to thank Gillies for the, the opportunity of being here and, and the opportunity to, uh, uh, to have a chat. I, I, um, I've been to quite a few meetings. Uh, never have I been uh, so well looked after in terms of being picked up from the airport and, and brought here today and uh, uh, really, really nice. I feel a bit special. So th thank you so much um, to Gillies. <laughs> Um, the other thing I'd say is, uh, you know, I've been to uh, meetings in Australia and uh, in Nice and uh, all over the world, really, and uh, this is the best card I have ever seen in terms of masculinity's work and health. It really is the... It's like a who's who, so it's just such a, a great event to be at, and I've really enjoyed the day. So hopefully I can uh, share a little bit of what I'm thinking about at the moment uh, in my work with you uh, over the next 20 minutes. So again, thanks very much for, for having me. Um, I, I talked about a tripartite. I talked about this notion of wanting to talk to empirical, methodological and the uh, theoretical aspects of masculinity's work. And I think it's fair enough that a decade later that, that you kind of, it, it gives you pause, gives you an opportunity to think about a few things. And one of the things that strikes me is that when we talk about men's health, there's quite a, quite a number of different ways of, of cutting it up. Um, I think about the biomedical. So I was in a conference at Nice last year, and uh, it was very biomedical, but it was focused uh, pretty much on erectile dysfunction. Um, it was also focused on pharmaceuticals. It was focused on... Uh, the treatment of erectile dysfunction under the guise of cardiovascular disease, under the guise of prostate cancer. And I worry about that. I worry about that in terms of whether we're actually selling drugs under the guise of men's health. So, for example, the Levitra advertisement that refers to an orodispersible tablet is one that you don't have to stop foreplay and take a drink of water. It's one that you can put under your tongue sublingually and it will allow everything to just keep moving. The other thing, Zydenica, uh, a company out of South Korea, and they've named uh, their pharmaceutical company Dong-A, which is Donga. And it's interesting that they are going after the market in Russia and in Europe. And these are billion-dollar markets huge markets. So when people talk about men's health, and we're talking about at that conference, you know, checking a man's cardiovascular disease by his ability to get an erection, I was a little bit concerned about, you know, where exactly we were going with the biomedical. And these posters that we use throughout the presentations that I share with you today uh, are sort of are evidence of a, a certain discourse around men's health. It's interesting, the same kind of issues... Uh, around prostate cancer that were in my PhD uh, work, um, I looked at men's experiences of prostate cancer and it seemed to be such a discordant place to, to some of the biomedical. This is a 74-year-old man called Ramwick and he says, from the neck down to my waist, it's not my normal body. I've, had a, I've, I've always had a truck driver's body because I've always been a working person. Now, that body, to me, is not mine. So Randwick's, you know, working-class body is missing, yet he's surrounded by the working-class achievements. The mantle and the glass case behind him contain many artefacts. Each had a story, represented a moment, a significant achievement. Glass jars at either side, at the bottom of the photograph, near the heater, contain souvenir matchboxes from the places he and Bess had travelled in their... Uh, travelled in their, in their travels across the world. Overseas destinations including Los Angeles, Turkey and Egypt were remembered through these mementos and demonstrated the rewards of hard work. So many of us are doing work in illness and then we've got the biomedical piece and they do seem to be at some level of disjunction. So Ramwick's, uh, Ramwick had undergone cardiovascular repairs, he'd had a quadruple bypass, 
He'd had uh, prostatectomy followed by radiation therapy, followed by androgen deprivation therapy, and had developed gynecomastia. I thought he was in pretty good shape, but it's interesting the lived experience of his body and his perceptions of how he looked were quite different to that. The third one that I'd suggest is the men's movement. Um, I, I go up and back on this a little bit because uh, it gets put forward sometimes uh, as, a, as a political agenda. And uh, in the last slide today, I'll speak very briefly about a Canadian men's health policy, which is starting to get talked about at the moment. It is political. It seems highly political. Ten years later, after a designated Institute of Gender and Health in this country, we still often talk about gender being women's health. And so there is a political piece to it. I'm also struck by the money that's been put into centres for violence in which men don't really seem to be featuring very much. So the men's movement piece is another piece of this men's health story. I don't have the answers. I do see the three as doing very different things and somehow needing to have a dialogue in some way. So, to my presentation. Empirical. I'm not sure about whether we're going to be able to get much traction, or if, even if we ever did get any traction, about saying that the reason for men's health is because men don't live as long as women. Back in the 70s, the difference was 7.4 years. Today, in British Columbia, it's 4.4 years. I would estimate that in the next 30 to 40 years, there probably won't be a gap. So I find it a little bit difficult when we premise men's health as being on this difference. Perhaps what's more important is to think about what accounts for that difference. What are the issues within men's health? And if we line them up, and these are, these are British Columbian statistics again, it's cardiovascular disease, it's suicide, it's motor vehicle accidents, it's infectious diseases, most often HIV. It's liver failure, most often secondary to alcohol abuse or overuse. So when you dig down, you start to see these things. And what strikes me about all of these things is that they're modifiable. Surely these are intervention points where we can talk about making a difference. And so the way we situate men's health about whether it's life expectancy or whether if we make a case based on difference, at least let's, let's say where the differences are at. They also seem intricately connected to me. You know, as researchers, we compartmentalise these issues. I'm a HIV researcher. I'm a prostate cancer researcher. I, I look at depression. I look at suicide. But these things are so intricately connected that I wonder whether there's a way of bringing them together in a research program. And it's part of, I guess, what we, what we try to do. The other thing is, they're not just men's problems. They are so connected to family. They're so connected to the women in our lives. They're so connected to children. They're so connected to other men. And so when they're put forward as men's health issues, you know, in many ways, they affect everybody. So to be able to mediate, to be able to intervene, means that we can really help everybody in terms of health. The other thing I'd say is that this is very locale specific. This is British Columbia. And if we subdivide men and start looking at gay men, First Nations men, then the order of these will flip and in fact, there'll probably be some very different issues that would account for differences in their life expectancy. The other empirical one that I see a lot, and it's written about a lot, is men's help seeking. It's connected to masculinities many, many times. It's a very, very interesting area of research. And we talk about men's reluctance to go and see a doctor. We talk about... Uh, their stoicism, self-reliance. Some of us get into alexithymia. You know, we, we, we've got a, a bunch of different reasons for it. Again, when I pull the statistics on this and I look at the numbers, and again, this is British Columbia, 
Yes, men do go to the doctor less often than women, but where we see the biggest gap is between the ages of 20 and 45. This is our major gap. You could say, well, you know, it's an artefact, at least in part, of the obstetrics and gynae demands that are placed on women. You could also say that it's about men at a period of their life when work and perhaps family are their focus and they tend to just be performing quite well and just keep, keep on moving. The other thing is if you get the data from across Canada for all the emergency departments up to the age of 45, you will find men more often in every emergency department across Canada. 2% difference. It evens out after 45 years of age. So, guys, do go to the doctor. They probably just go to different doctors. They probably go at different points in their life. But it's not good enough to say that blokes don't go to the doctor. I would say, you know, in terms of the empirical, we just need to be a little bit more sophisticated about how we talk about men's health and the positioning of it and digging into the problems within the category that we refer to as men. Theoretically. So, back in 2000, there was a great article, and it was an article that I think started out many, many of us being interested in, in men's health and masculinities. And it was by Will Courtney. And it was the constructions of masculinity and their influence on men's well-being, a theory of gender and health in social science and medicine. I, along with about 693 other people at last count on Google Scholar, have cited this work, have cited this particular article. And what it suggests is that there's a hegemonic masculinity and that in relation to this hegemonic masculinity, unitary notion, that we would reformulate, rely or reject it based on our circumstances within particular disease processes. Socioeconomic status, probably ethnicity as well. And it was a wonderful roadmap to get us thinking about masculinity. But a decade later, it kind of leaves us in a place where we're having trouble with a unitary notion of hegemonic masculinity. We're not really accounting for the diversity within masculine ideals if we stick to this script. And it sort of privileges the white Western middle class kind of piece of it. And I think it's, I think it's difficult. And it's a-empirical. It, it is a conversation about taking Connell's work and adding it to health. So in many ways, I think we're ready for a, a little bit of a change. 